I'm Maria, and you're about to watch a message that was preached here at Calvary Fellowship in Miramar, Florida. At Calvary, we exist to help people take their next step with God, and we pray that this message helps you do just that. So, how is everybody doing? It's great to see you. It has been too long. It really has. It's been too long. It's been great. The other guys did a great job. Uh, Pastor John, a few weeks ago, Mark. Two weeks ago, George, Pastor George last week. Great, great job. I couldn't be any prouder of those guys. Um, but, but where do we begin when it's been so long since we've been together? That's really... So we have to begin at the Cheesecake Factory because that's where all good stories begin. So a few weeks ago, my family and I, we were uh, at the Cheesecake Factory uh, for dinner. And then we came home and my son uh, hops out of the car and he has this... Reality. My son is six, uh, Xander, and, he, and he's like, Dad, my, my, I left my my Lego stormtroopers at the at the at, at the restaurant, and so I'm like, let's go. So we get back in the car, we go, we drive back to the Cheesecake Factory, and um, no Lego stormtroopers were to be found. And it, and I went back to the table. People were already eating there. I went under the table which really made the relationship a little awkward with the people who were eating. Um, but nonetheless, we couldn't find them. He's heartbroken that he had lost them. And I said, listen, buddy. Um, and, you know, I mean, we had only paid like five bucks for him. So I'm like, you know, God is gracious. So let us be gracious. Because when you're talking about, you, you know, it's good to say it in a British accent. And uh, so I took him to the store. I replaced the $5 Lego Stormtroopers. I get points as the greatest dad in the world. And crisis averted. And so... Now, um, we go up to, um, we were up in Orlando for a couple of weeks, and I was uh, speaking, uh, there was a conference that I hosted, I'll tell you about that in a little bit, but um, we, were, we were there, uh, and we had dinner at Downtown Disney, and then afterwards, we were walking around Downtown Disney, and we get to this, they have this Marvel superhero store, and my son, of course, um, loves, he loves Captain America and loves uh, Iron Man. And so we're in there and he's looking at the Captain America and Iron Man stuff. And then he's like, Ugh. and he has this moment and he just starts to cry. And I'm like, what's wrong with you? And he's like, dad, you, 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 you remember, remember how you gave me your old iPad? Yes. Well, I left it at the restaurant. <laughs> and so Carrie, we're not too far. So Carrie's like, Hey, I'll go over. I get my phone out. And I do like, the, you know, you have that app, Find My iPhone. And so I look and, I, you know, uh, I see that the iPad is still at the restaurant. And so we're like, you know, doo -doo 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 -doo. we're doing one of those things, like the people at the beach that are looking for buried treasure. Um, and so we find the iPad, still in the same booth we were in. Carrie picks it up. Now, while Carrie was leaving to get it until she came back, um, that triggered the speech of the you have to be a responsible member of society and uh, so I had to tell him that, and I went like full corporate parenting on him, um, you know, because I always thought like, oh, I'm going to be like a cool dad, you know, like you got to go full corporate on, on stuff like that. So I went, I went in that, you got to be responsible, you can't take things out of the house, and you know, you're never going to get nice things again, you know, you're just going to get like little twigs and stuff to play with, that's it, you know. Um, anyway, so she gets, he gets it back, crisis of her, I'm never going to leave it again. So anyway, a few days later, we are, uh, my son has never been to uh, the Jedi Academy to, um, you know, you fight Darth Vader, you become an official Padawan learner. It's a very important thing in our family to go through that. And um, so, but if your age is four to 12, and by the way, they're really hard on that oldest being 12, um, not from personal experience or anything, but let's just say had a little altercation. Um, and so anyway, uh, so we go there, but it's a very popular attraction, so you got to get there early. We get there an hour before the park opens. And so, because my youngest daughter, Livy, who's three, she's not awake yet, so Carrie says, listen, why don't you stay? Or she says, I'll stay at, at, the, at, the hotel, uh, at the hotel, and I'll just go, I'll meet you guys at the park, and you and Mia and Xander go early. I said, that's fine. In fact, why don't you stay with the car, and um, I'll just, you know, it's like $4 to take a, little, to take a cab over there. And so, um, so we take, so I, I get the kids, we go downstairs, we get a cab, we drop, they drop us off right at the front of Hollywood Studios, and now we're like the second people in line, because um, you get there an hour before the park opens, so that we can um, get, be early to fight uh, Darth Vader. So we're standing in line, we're talking, just, you know, joking around, and then my son starts freaking out. 
I mean, it's like just having some kind of attack. And I'm like, what's wrong? And he's like, I left Teddy in the car. Now, you got to understand, Teddy is a teddy bear that Xander won like two years ago uh, when we were at uh, Disney World, but he won him. And since then, he and Teddy have become the closest of comrades. And so, I mean, he takes, and I'm like, well, why did you bring a teddy bear to a lightsaber fight? And so, and he's like, well, I just thought that, that Teddy would want to see me fight Darth Vader. And I got so excited on the way that I left him in the, in the cab when we got out. So now, this puts me into now a bit of a predicament. At least now I know what I'm going to do for the next half hour before the park opens. I call Carrie. She's like, I'm like, what are you doing? She's like, oh, I'm on my way down um, to go get the car. I'm like, well, when you're on your way down as you're leaving, um, talk to the person at Valet and find out who, what company a cab they normally use uh, when they call someone. And so she goes down, she talks to this girl that's working in valet, and she says, you know, I'm going to get my car, this is what happened with my son. And so um, the girl goes into full CSI mode. And she's like, okay, don't worry about it, you just go, I'm going to work it out. She goes back, starts pulling surveillance tapes, this is not a joke, she pulls surveillance tape of me with my two kids getting into the cab. Then she gets a still shot of the cab company name. Another shot of the, uh, the number of the cab, you know, the, the, of the individual number of the car. Calls the cab company, says, I've got car number, blah, blah, blah. She gets patched through to the driver. And she says, listen to me, I'm calling from this hotel. And you have a teddy bear in the back of your car that is not paying fare. And he's like, Arr! And, uh, you know, because that's like a big thing. And so, uh, so he pulls over, looks in the back. Then shortly, enough, shortly after, my wife gets a text, which then gets forwarded to me, of this picture. Uh, Teddy, Teddy has been found and safe and sound. So stop the printing of the milk cartons. So he's okay. And so I show Xander that, and he's like, all right, it's okay. Everything's good. Now, you got to understand, because of that, um, my wife now and this valet girl have now become best friends because that's how it works. Because to know my wife is to love my wife. By the way, if you didn't know, the person who was hosting was my wife, Carrie. Those of you that, that didn't know, yeah, yes. That was my very beautiful wife, Carrie. And because uh, sometimes people are like, I hear you talk about your wife. Does she come to church here? And I'm like, yes, because it would be weird if she didn't. Um, and, then, uh, and then they find out, they're like, wow, you're married to her? Like, you? Yeah, me. I'm married. To really? Well, yeah. She loves the movie Beauty and the Beast. What can I say? So, well, anyway, the thing you got to understand is that any, like, at, my wife just has this ability. She meets people. Five minutes after, everyone loves her. And so now her and the valet girl are best friends. They've exchanged telephone numbers. They pray. He's, she's praying for her. Um, she's like, oh, do you know that she has a dot? Like, no, I didn't know anything about her life. Um, I would just walk by when I went to get the car and said hello. And she's like, oh, did you see she was downstairs? I didn't even see there were cars outside. I'm, I'm just not paying attention, you know, when I'm in, into something. And so anyway, so we're leaving. We're packing up the car. I've got all my stuff. And, you know, as a man, you know, you've got everything has to fit the same way that it came in. I'm a big, you know, when I'm not like, you know, like she's like, what, what do you have games on your, on your iPad? Yes, Tetris. That's the only game. So because it helps me in other areas of life. Uh, of organization, because most of life is just a game of Tetris. So anyway, so I'm organizing the suitcases and all this, and so in the process of all this, and then Carrie's hugging the girl, you know, keep in touch, stay cool over the summer, you know, all the things you write in, in yearbooks, and then, um, and, and then they're, uh, they're, you know, the kids are hugging and kissing this woman that we've met, you know, that found a bear, and, uh, and then, you know, me, I was like, Check you later. And uh, so anyway, so, so we're leaving and we're, you know, we're, we're on our way home. I'm excited. You know, after a while, I was like, yeah, I'm ready to go home. Um, and, and so I'm, we're headed home. About 30 minutes um, after we've left, she, this lady sends us this text. And um, those, are, those are my keys. Now, the Lego Darth Vader is a dead giveaway that they're my keys. And so, and I was like, oh, Lord Vader. No. Anyway. And it was like, right, no, it was one of those. And I was just mortified. 
that in the, in the hubbub of leaving, I had done the thing that I had just reprimanded my son about. And then I was talking, and Xander was like, so what happened? You ever have that? You're having a conversation with your spouse, and the kids are like, what's going on up there? What's up? Did something happen? No, nothing. And, and then, um, anyway, so the car started, and uh, it was one of those, like, key fob kind of things, whatever, Toyota deal. And so, and then, um, nonetheless, so, the, but the, th- the car was running on Carrie's keys, which were in her purse. I left my keys. And so I couldn't even look my son in the eye after everything, after how much I had just harassed him over the whole thing. And he's like, mm-hmm, you know, he's giving me that. And so now the, the funny thing is the story doesn't actually end there because uh, Pastor Mark was actually at Epcot. And so I call him and I'm like, listen, when you leave Epcot, I need you to swing by the, ho- the hotel that I was at. I need you to go there, go to valet, tell them who you are, and tell them that you're looking for my keys, and pick them up, and then just bring them to the office tomorrow. And he says, okay, great. Well, then, um, next day, Mark, we're up in the office, and he says, hey, here are your keys. He hands me my keys. I'm like, oh, and but he says, you want to see something weird? And he opens up this app that he has for, like, you know, these things that you can attach to anything, you know, your phone or whatever, your keys. And he says, you know what the weird part is, is that, and he shows me his keys, like the where his keys are. He got to the hotel to get my keys, and then he left his keys at the hotel. And so he's like, you see, my keys are in Orlando. And I'm like, this is like one of those chain letters that has just gone bad. My son started it. It passed to me. I've passed it on to Mark, and I don't know. If he tells you to do anything, hey, can I borrow your car? Don't. You will never see it again. It will get lost. It is, I'm telling you, it's a chain letter gone bad. And uh, now, here you say, well, now, why do I tell you this? Number one, because it's been so long since we've seen each other. And uh, I have to tell you that. And then I have to tell you, because it won't, no, I tell you this all the time, that nothing in my life is easy. I can't leave and go home and it'd be easy. It's just not the way it works. And the second is, or the third thing is, is that um, it's just peace can be disrupted in your life so easily. Because now I get, I was like, you know, Xander, it's a bear. Relax. And then, like, and I'm like, because in the moment that I realized I had forgotten my kids, like, no! I mean, like, no, why did I, what did I do? What did I do to deserve this? I mean, I had had, I, I, and I'm like, wow, I get it. I understand how my son was feeling. And I just told him to tough it out, you know, because that's pretty much, that's like most of my parenting. It's like, wasn't it? Tough it out. But my leg's broken. Tough it out, you know. Anyway, <laughs> but listen, but we spend most of our lives, trying to find peace. We spend our lives trying to find peace in our relationships, in our marriage, with our kids, uh, with our, our, our career, with our future, man. It's like, man, is, 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 is it, is it going to work out? And, and the problem is, once again, is that it can get disrupted so easily. And we've been in this series called Greater. Um, and, and the thing that we've been looking at, James has been challenging us to several things. But one of the things uh, that James has been doing, we've been working our way through the book of James, Jesus' younger brother, um, who wrote this book to um, these churches that have been scattered. And he's been telling them, the thing that he's challenging them on is, if you want to know why you don't have peace, this is the reason. If you want to know why there's conflict, there's disagreement, there's turmoil, he's going to show us where it comes from, where it begins, the the root cause of it. And he's going to show us that it doesn't start externally. It starts internally. And the way that peace happens is not external. It begins internally. And so listen, if you're here and there's trouble brewing, whether it's at home, whether it's at work, listen, you are in the right place. Um, if you're here and you're like, man, I've got this conflict with my children and I don't know why, listen, uh, you, this, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, we're, the Bible's going to tell us why. And if there's a problem in the workplace, wherever it is, in your marriage, James is going to show us where the problem begins, but he's also going to show us where peace is found. So if you'd open your Bible with me to the book of James chapter 4, that's where we're going to begin, or you can uh, the notes that we gave you have every verse that we're going to cover. So you're going to have a complete document of everything we're going to talk about today. So James 4, verse 1, it says, Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desire for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight in war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you don't receive because you ask amiss that you might spend it on your pleasures. Adulterers and adulteresses, 
Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? And whoever, therefore, wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealousy, jealously? Therefore, he gives more grace, he says, but God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Now, if you pause there and give me your attention, there's three things that I want to show you about where peace comes from. Here's the first one if you're a note taker. And that is that peace comes when I abandon selfish desires. I abandon selfish desires. Now, the thing that we all have to recognize, whether we want to or not, is that all of us, to one degree or another, are a bit self-involved. Not me. Yes, you. And me too. When you look at a picture with a bunch of people, you're looking to see how you look first, right? That is called, be called being self-involved. Um, that, because that's what I do. You wake up in the morning, who's the first person you're thinking about? Yourself. Why? Because you're always on your mind. I'm always on my mind. It's just the way it is. And how do I know this to be the case, that we're always on our mind because of this insane invention called the selfie stick? When someone first showed me, yeah, look, even, he has not even escaped it, the power of the selfie stick. Now, the, the problem, the, 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 see, history will record that there was a moment when civilization was lost, and it is not going to be an issue of, oh, this legislation was passed. No, it will be when the invention and implementation and purchasing in mass quantities of the selfie stick came into being. It came into being. Um, now, I want you to think about this. Is why does a person buy a selfie stick? A person buys a selfie stick because the thought of taking a picture that they're not in is just too much to bear. <laughs> and so they're, they're, it's like, if I'm not in it, why even bother taking my phone out? And so, you know, yeah, but it's the Grand Canyon. And? Oh, wait. But if it's me in the Grand Canyon, <laughs> you see, that would make it a little bit grander, wouldn't it? And see, and, and, and it's like, and it's not even, and it's a weird thing because there's, and there's a couple of different, you know, like the, the, the selfie has, has evolved, has it not? There was the one where it's like you see the person's arm and that's like, psh, come on, that's like rookie, you know? And then there's this other thing. And now I'm telling you, I, when I was at, uh, we were at Disney and at Universal, the number of selfie sticks that I saw, uh, it was, it was criminal. I mean, because uh, everything was it, was, it was all this. And then it's like, where are these, it's like, oh, no, 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 we're just taking pictures for, for fun. There was a time that you would say, excuse me, sir, would you, would you take a picture? Uh, oh, thank you. No, we don't do that anymore. We don't need to talk to people. We have no need for another human being unless they're in the picture. And so, unless that other person is going to take a picture of us if they're friends with us, but we want them to be in the picture. And then there's this other thing where it's like it comes at this top angle, like, what's this stuff? No, 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 it's just taken by a drone coming by. You know, they just took a picture. It's, a weird, it's the weirdest thing. So James says, he says, well, why do we have, why, why is there conflict? And it all comes down to selfie. It does. It's all about your selfie. It is. He says, why is there conflict among you. Why are there wars and fights? Don't they come for your desire or your lust for pleasure? Once again, pleasure in and of itself, nothing wrong with it. But when it's a lust for pleasure, that is a desire that is completely out of control, that's when the problems start. And when he talks about pleasure, it's the word hedon in Greek, where we get our English word hedonism, which if you're not like, what in the world is hedonism? Hedonism is a philosophy that the only thing that matters in life is pleasure. And once again, it's that self, selfie attitude that causes all problems in relationships. Because selfishness is the, the most destructive force in any relationship. And that's the number one reason why marriages fail, people break up. Uh, why? It's, it's just, it's selfishness. because It's people not getting their way. People get married. Why do you want to get married? Oh, I'm getting married because I want to be happy. But very, I don't hear very many people say, why do you want to get married? Because I want to make this other person the most happy, the, the, the happiest person in the world. Like, rare, I don't know if I've ever heard that. But I've heard, why do, see, I want to be happy. So that's why I, I want to get married. Right? But, but we don't do it, uh, we don't say it in the other, what about the other person? Well, you know, if they make me happy, it'll work out for them too. You know, and so that's what we're thinking. But you know what the, the, the reality is, is that if you get married, and you say, you know what, I'm not going to make this marriage about me, I'm going to make it about the other person. 
do you, do you realize this is part that's totally counterintuitive, but you will actually be happier than if you tried to make your marriage just about you. And the reason is this, and I've said this so many times, that people actually don't have marriage problems. They actually have discipleship problems. In fact, Jesus would say it this way. It's up on the screen. Uh, he says this. He says, therefore, he said to them, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. If you want peace, there's going to have to be some denial of self. And that's why James really hits the nail on the head when he says this. He says, why is there conflict, wars, and fights? It is this, this lust, this out-of-control desire for pleasure to please myself, and I don't get it. And so then what happens? If you read the verses, it just continues to escalate. He says, there's... Um, you know, there, there's this desire that war in your members, you lust, you don't have, you murder, you covet, you fight, you war. See how this, the language keeps getting more and more intense. He says, you want something and you don't get it. And by the way, it doesn't have to be a possession. It could be a feeling. It could be being acknowledged. It could be being treated in a certain way. And it's just, and the thing about it is, is that, and if you don't get it, it's, that's what's going to cause this eruption to take place. And the amazing part to me is that, um, it's, it can happen so easily and you don't even realize it. Uh, I told you guys that part of, we were in Orlando on vacation, but part of what we were doing is um, I hosted a conference, a three-day conference for pastors um, from all of, we actually had uh, people attending from a few different countries, a couple different countries, and it was me teaching on leadership, preaching, evangelism, a whole bunch of stuff. And man, the guys loved it. Um, that, you know, like we would tell, basically we're telling them, you know, here's what we do at Calvary. Here's how you can implement that in your ministry. And man, people left. And they're like, man, Calvary is the greatest church in the world, to which they are correct. Um, and so, but man, I would get back, I'd go back up to the hotel. And I mean, I was like on cloud nine. I'm being used by God to, to influence pastors and church leaders. And Carrie would tell me, you know, to say how to go. And um, and I would just say, man, I was, I felt great. You know, people are, are imp, you know, writing down everything. And they just thought, you know, we were like the greatest thing ever. And then she listens for a minute, and I'm really carrying on about the whole thing. And she's like, uh-huh. Well, that's great, Bob. Hey, now that you're back, you think you could um, help us pick up uh, the room and throw out some garbage? And so the weekend, and I'm like, whoa, whoa. I'm sorry. I'm changing the world out there. I don't have time for garbage. This is, this is for the other people. I'm doing, I'm doing God's work out here. Okay. And so, and, and, and so, and I'm, I'm like, whoa, you know, and so I'm telling, so I'm telling her this, um, I can't, I'm, whoa, you know, I don't have, I'm VIP. I'm sorry. And, uh, and she's, and, and you got to understand about my wife, like, um, she is totally unfazed by any of that. Uh, like, you know, we think you're great. We think you're awesome. Um, she's totally unfazed. I'm, completely phased by it, but she's totally unfazed by it, and, and so she's, she's listening. She's like, Bob, I know those pastors think you're awesome, um, but they don't know you. I do know you, and it would be awesome if you could come back to reality with us, and, and so that's kind of where most of life is lived, somewhere between like VIP and garbage man, you know, somewhere, <laughs> right, somewhere in there, and now here's the problem. And this is the, the reason I tell you that is because God cannot use you and God cannot diffuse the conflict if you keep thinking that you're VIP and everything else is beneath you. That's why we need the one thing that James says is the cure-all uh, for this. Why is there all this conflict? Because there is, there is this desire for you to have, and you can't get it, and now you just keep with more intensity and, 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 and all this. You just keep wanting it. And then James says, well, so what's the, what does he do? And then James, at the, uh, he, said, he quotes the scriptures, and he says this. He says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And there really is this... Um, this thing that humility can do to transform any relationship. Uh, and tra humility is a word that really gets very little respect in our culture because we see humility as a sign of weakness in, the, in our culture, but really it's a sign of strength. What is humility? Um, here's my definition. Humility is knowing who I am in light of who God is. That's it. It's not that nothing is below you, nothing is above you. It's I just know who I am in light of who God is. So I'm not trying to be more than I am. I'm not trying to be less than I am. 
I'm just trying to, what the Bible would say in uh, chapter 12 of Romans, verse 3, for us to have a sober estimation of who we are. But see, the problem is, is that when we start thinking that everything is about us, and we walk into our workplace, we walk into our family, we walk into our marriage, we walk into our friendships, we walk into everything, and it's always about us, then listen, there will always be conflict if every relationship is, it's all about me. And listen, pride will poison everything because that's all that pride can do is poison everything and everyone it comes into contact with. But you know what humility does? Man, humility is the balm that brings healing into relationships and situations. And James is actually going to go on and explain to us what that kind of humility looks like. Look at verse 7. He says, Therefore, in light of that, God resists the proud, gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hearts, or cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, double, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Now, if you pause there and give me your attention, second thing I want to show you in your notes, uh, number one is that peace comes when I abandon selfish desires. Number two is that peace comes when I submit to God. Submit to God. Listen, any relationship, and what I don't want, to, uh, want you to think is if we talk about how to bring, um, you know, um, healing into relationships and harmony into relationships, that, that every, you can have relationships that are completely conflict-free. Um, any relationship that has any level of depth is going to have conflict because there's always going to be two or more people that have differing opinions. And so that's just the way it is. But what I'm saying is, is that, uh, and listen, you can even, you, you, I even have conflict with myself sometimes. You ever do that? You ever be like, I should do that, but I don't want to do that. But you need to do that, but I don't want to do that. I, I should do that, but I don't want to do that. You're having conflict with yourself. And that's just how it works sometimes. But listen, there can be, and, and, and let me just say this. My wife and I, you know, you saw my wife earlier. My wife and I are as different as can be. We really are. We are as different as can be. And, um, you know, how many of you, if I can ask, how many of you have ever taken like the Myers-Briggs, you know, personality test? Can I ask that? Um, well, okay, well, six of you, great. Um, you know, the last service, a lot of, you know, so you got to catch up to those guys. So, you know, go home tonight, take that. Take that test. You'll be better for it. But we've taken, we've taken that. We take our whole staff through that. I think Pastor George talked about that in his message last week. And um, now, and so my wife and I, we take like, you know, those personality tests. And every time we take those personality tests, we are like complete opposites. And so like we're both introverted. Um, we're both kind of lean towards the creative side. But then like, you know, I'm a thinker. She's a feeler. You know, I, I have no need for emotion whatsoever. You know, and so anyway, but I'm just more like I think through things kind of more analytically. Um, you know, she, she, she's more, more on the emotional side. And so, and then, you know, I tend to be a quick decision maker. She takes a longer time making decisions. Anyway, so, but then whenever you have those decisions, if you, have taken, if you ever taken Myers-Briggs, you know it comes down to four letters. And so, but then the fun thing you can do is these people, um, they take famous movies, and then they will... Uh, they'll take the famous movies, and then what character are you in the movies? And so, like, I, I did this and, and with Carrie. This is a fun thing that we did. And so I took our, both of our personality profiles and I, based on Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter, and Marvel Comics. I took, and so I didn't come up with this. These are these charts that they come up with based on these characters and the personality types. And so based on my wife's profile, she is Luke Skywalker, Frodo, Harry Potter, and Spider-Man. That is who she is based on her. Um, now, let me show you what mine is. I'll show you Carrie's. Mine is the Emperor, <laughs> Sauron, Lord Voldemort, and Magneto. And every time we take it, I am always the arch villain who is crafting all sorts of evil. All, I'm always the bad guy. And not just the bad guy, but always the guy, the architect of the evil plan is always my personality type. And so my wife always sees this. She's like, what in the world would you be like if you weren't a Christian? <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know. I'm, I think I'd be in prison. <laughs> I said, but the good news is, looking at these guys, 
I'd probably be running the prison, so that's something. So, but I'm telling you this, right? My wife and I are just examples. You can be as different as can be, but still experience peace and harmony in your relationships. And the question is how? Let me give you three ways that, that'll help. Number one, make God your final authority. Your final authority. That's why he says in verse 7, Therefore, in light of the fact that God says he opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble, if that's the case, then the first thing you do is submit to God. And that is that you make God and his word the final word on the subject. If you, th- if, 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 if you find someone who says, Yeah, I know what God says, but I have this other thought, you have not made God the final authority in your life. God is not, uh, because you can't have peace in your relationships. You can't have the peace of God uh, working in your life if God isn't ruling and reigning. The Bible says this in your notes in Colossians 3, let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which also you were called to one body and be thankful. The second thing is this. One, make God your final authority. Number two, be wise to Satan's tactics. Be wise to Satan's tactics. James says, therefore submit to God. Then he says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. That word resist is a military term. It's talking about being prepared and standing against something. Why? Because there is a real enemy who really does want to destroy your marriage, destroy your family, destroy your friendships and destroy your life. And listen, this enemy that we have loves conflict, confusion, disappointment, chaos, hurt feelings, all of that. That's why the Bible tells us in in 2 Corinthians, he says, so that Satan will not outsmart us, for we are familiar with his evil schemes. Now listen, when I talk about um, the devil, please understand that I'm not talking about a uh, characterization of the devil where I'm like, you know, because he has you know, horns and a pitchfork and he wears red spandex that's real tight, you know, um, and he also sells deviled ham uh, or whatever. You know, I'm I'm not talking about that, but the Bible actually says this. It says in, in 2 Corinthians, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. Because, listen, the tactics of our enemy, he just has this way of trying to whisper things into our ear. It's like, yeah, you know, I really do deserve that. Hey, why don't they treat me like that? Hey, don't I deserve this? Yeah, I do. And listen, what? Yeah, why aren't they doing it? My way really is is the best. And And listen, it's just, it's so subtle, and yet it will just derail your relationships and ultimately derail your life. When Jesus was tempted by Satan in Matthew chapter 4, he, uh, when he, Satan came to him, tempted him, and three times he tempted him, and Jesus responded every time, three words, it is written. And he quoted the scriptures back to Satan when, he, when Jesus was tempted. You know why? Because our identity is found in who God says we are, not anywhere else. Hey, if you're really the son of God, why don't you go and do this? No, 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 I don't have to prove it to you. I don't have to go, no, because this is what's written. Our identity is found in who God says we are, not anywhere else. And by the way, can I just say this? Because I hear people say this, you know, they're fighting the devil and whatever. Um, Your job is not to fight the devil. Your job, the Bible says, is to resist the devil and he will flee. It reminds me of the story of this church did testimony night and they had people come up and this this, uh, woman and her husband come up and she starts, she's like really intense, just talking, you know, wickedness is everywhere. There's evil that's trying to take me down. I've had a terrible fight with Satan all week. And she's saying all this, and they kind of start turning to her husband. And, uh, and he's like, listen, it's not my fault. She's very difficult to get along with. Um, so anyway, some of you are going to get that later. I'm like, oh, they thought, okay, yeah. There we go. It's like a delayed reaction. There we go. Hello, hello, hello. There's going to be somebody in the back in five minutes. Ha! <laughs> Just got that. That's crazy. They, they thought, whoo, good one. All right. Glad you caught up. Okay. Uh, last thing. All right. How do we, how do we experience peace and, and harmony in our relationships? Number three, and that is to be actively pursuing God. Actively pursuing God. James tells us uh, in verse eight, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. We've got to keep taking steps towards him in our relationship. Why? Because no one can live a conflict-free life. You know how I know that? Because Jesus had conflict. He was around doing good things, and people had a problem with it. 
And there's going to be times that you, you're doing something good and then people still have a problem with it. It's like, hey, there was this guy, he was lame for 38 years and I healed him. Well, I can't believe you did that. You did it on this day and that way and come on, you did it, you did it not in our prescribed manner and it's just, they still had a problem. That's why I love what, uh, I love what Romans says. It's in your notes. Romans chapter 12. I want you to notice the caveats that God gives to us. He says, if it is possible, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. And the Bible doesn't do that all the time. It'll just say, you know, this is the deal. That's it. But th in, in this case, because God recognizes that there's people that he created that are completely crazy. And, and uh, he's like, you know, listen, listen, I know. I made them. Something went wrong. This, there, was, there was problems at the factory. I don't know what the deal is. But if it is possible, as much as it depends on you, Live at peace with these people, you know. And, and it's, I just I find that funny. Uh, and, and the thing is this, why? Because there are people that are just impossible. God recognizes there are people that are impossible to get along with. And so what do you do? Well, you limit contact with those people. Yeah, but I'm married to those per that person. <laughs> oh, We've got to pray for you. And, uh, and so, but, or it's like, oh, not, that person's a member of my family, or I work with that person. And uh, then what do you got to do? Then what you got to realize is there's going to be conflict. And if you're going to be conflict, you're going into this as more of a ministry because you want to reach them um, for the Lord. But just recognize that it's just not going to be easy. Why? Because, but, but the key is, is that if there's going to be conflict, don't be the reason for the conflict. And so, and, that, and that's really the point. And so, because as you draw closer to God, what he does is he transforms your life. And that's why at the end of verse 10, he says, so humble yourself in the sight of God, and then he will be the one who lifts you up. Last, last verse is verse 11. He says, and do not speak evil of one another, brethren, for he who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. And there is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. And who are you to judge another? Now, if you pause there, last thing I want to show you, and that is this, is that peace comes when I stop condemning others. Now, can I, can I ask you this? Have you ever had someone say to you these three words, don't judge me? You ever have that, right? That is the, the you know, the, like people start quoting Matthew 7, the favorite verse of social media. Um, the, you know, Bible, Bible says don't judge. You know, uh, like I love this. People don't know anything about the Bible, but they start throwing around Matthew 7. Doesn't the Bible say judge not lest ye be judged? Like really, ye? <laughs> really? Like, I didn't know you were all King Jamesy on this. You know, I'm still like people, they start, they start throwing that out. Like, and, and then, you know, it's like, Bible says, don't judge. And then, like, well, what in the world does that mean? Didn't Jesus say not to judge? Well, yeah, but and then another place, he did say to judge. And if you're going to judge, do it right. No, he didn't. No, he did. I haven't seen that as a meme on Facebook. Well, it's because it's not up yet. But it's around. Look at what it says. Uh, you know, John 7, 24. Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. What in the world do I do with that? Because he said not to judge. And then he says, if you're going to judge, you better do it the right way. What in the world is going to go on here? So what, what happens? Listen, judging, because the whole thing when we say, oh, you shouldn't judge people, that means, that, let me tell you what that doesn't mean. That doesn't mean that, well, you just need to say that everything that everyone does ever is okay. That, now, that's what people want you to do. Sometimes they don't judge. And it doesn't matter what they do. I spent too much money. Don't judge me. You came home late from curfew. Don't judge me. I was convicted of a felony. Do not judge me. Yes, but I'm the judge. No, don't judge me. You know, your honor, don't judge me. And so this is what happens. Now, this is, we, we misunderstand, we misunderstand what, what Jesus is talking about. There's two Greek words here. Now, the problem is this, is that English um, kind of fails us sometimes. Typical English vernacular is one million words. The language, the, the Greek language that the New Testament was written in, 32 million words. It is a much more robust language, way more nuanced than, than we can handle in the English that we speak. So when Jesus says, judge not in Matthew 7, you may want to circle that in your, in your notes. 
And judge not. Here's what that word is in Greek. Krino, K-R-I-N-O. And here's what that word means. In, in, here's what that word means literally. To condemn someone. To condemn them. When Jesus, Jesus is saying, don't condemn people. In, math, in John 7, when he says, don't judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment, he's using a different Greek word. He's using the word diakrino, D-I-A-K-R-I-N-O. And that means to identify, to judge to identification. Not to judge for condemnation, crino, diakrino, to judge to identification. And the reason that we can't judge to condemnation is because we don't have all the facts. I had this happen a couple of years ago. I was in Epcot. And I was at the American Adventure. And any American Adventure fans? If you're, wow, okay, that's rough. Thank you very much. That makes three of us, from including the first two services. So we can start our own club. I love the American Adventure. I cry when I go to the American Adventure. You know, like the America, spread your golden wing. That's not the song, by the way, guys. Um, anyway, um, they're, they're learning it for next time. But uh, now, I love the American Adventure, and so one of the things that they do, because such a powerful presentation of the, the founding principles of America, is that they say no flash photography and all this, and there's this lady who comes in um, with her family, starts taking all these, I mean, like everybody gets out their camera and starts taking flash photography, and I'm, I'm so frustrated, and, and, I'm, and, and I'm like, no flash photography, you know, I'm doing this kind of thing, and I'm like throwing all kinds of crino in their direction, all kinds of condemnation throwing it out to the people right in front of me and I'm you know and I'm trying to like <coughs> no flash, you know, so I'm doing that you know <coughs> rudeness and so um, so I'm, I'm saying all this right and then they get done the thing gets is over and whatever and then we're leaving and then um, someone says oh excuse me and the people just I, and I realize and I'm like wow and then the people start talking they're all speaking Portuguese and I'm like they don't understand a word of English they heard the thing about flash. They don't even know what flash photography is because it's not. And, and, I'm, and I'm realizing like you can't. Well, see, here's why Jesus is saying you can't condemn people. It's because you don't have all the information. That's what he's talking about. You don't condemn people because you don't have all the facts. But the diacrino, yeah, we're, we're allowed to do that. Why? Because when there's someone that we love and someone that we love is making a really, really bad choice. The only act of love, if you really care about them, is to tell them that, listen, the road that you're going on doesn't lead where you want it to. And he says, and if you want, and so Jesus is saying, if, don't judge according to appearance what you think you see. If you're gonna judge, you're gonna judge according to righteous judgment. What does God's word say in light of the situation, the decisions, and the trajectory of where this person is going? And he says that if you're gonna judge, that's the only way that we judge. That's that's the key. And listen, and see, sometimes when we think about why there isn't peace and why there's so much conflict, disagreement, hostility, could it be that there has been some condemnation in our relationships? Could it be that there's been conflict because there has been this incessant need of something that we wanted to extract from the relationship? No, but there's something that I wanted to get from you and that's why there was conflict because you weren't giving it to me and whatever, whatever it might have been. And so, listen, over and over again, and it's like, and sometimes we have to come to this understanding that, hey, you know what, maybe, maybe the conflict is happening, as James would say, it's happening because there is this incessant need to be right. There's this incessant need for it to be about me and that's what poisons every relationship. And so Jesus says to us, listen, if you want to find your life, you got to lose it. you got to make it not about you. And you know what you'll find? The very thing that you were looking for. And so he says to us, listen, our lives can't be about us. Our marriages, our friendships, our families, careers, all that. It can't be about us. There's got to be some death to self so that we can submit to God, draw near to him. And then he has this ability of lifting us up higher than we ever thought possible. And so maybe today we find ourselves here and what we find ourselves is in this place where there's been some destruction in relationships. And we're saying, how do we, I want to fix this. How do I fix this? I want this to be different. How do I, how do I make this different? Well, then what needs to happen 
is that there's got to be this moment where we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God and then we watch him lift us up. And for some of us, that might be the most difficult thing that we've ever done in our lives is to humble ourselves before God so that he could lift us up and transform our lives and make our lives something different than we ever thought possible, something greater than we ever dreamed. And maybe this is the moment for some of us. Let's pray together. And Lord, we want to thank you. Thank you that you give us opportunity to come back to you, that you never give up on us, but you're always offering us another chance and another chance and another chance. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. Thank you for your work in us. And God, I pray that today would be the day for some of us to humble ourselves before you, that you might lift us up. Listen, with every head bowed, with every eye closed as we're praying together, if you're saying, Pastor, you were talking about me, I need to humble myself before God. I need to see God do a great work in my life. I need to experience the forgiveness that comes from Jesus, and I need to see that kind of forgiveness and grace permeated through my life. Listen, if that's you, I want to pray for you as we close. So with every head bowed, with every eye closed, I'm going to invite you to just lift a hand so I can pray for you as we close. Yeah, wow. Lots of hands all over this room. God bless you guys. Lord, I want to thank you for every hand that's lifted that represents a heart that is open. And I pray, God, by the power of your spirit that you would meet each person here. God, you know our needs, you know our failings, you know what's happening in our lives, and you want to act. And so I pray that as we reach in your direction, that you would meet us here and that life would be different as we call out to you that we would humble ourselves in your sight and that you really would be the one who lifts us up. Listen, those of you that lifted a hand, I'm gonna invite you to pray a prayer with me, a prayer of commitment. And uh, I wanna invite you to repeat it out loud to God. And just say, Lord God, I open my heart and I invite you inside to be my God, my savior, my friend. Forgive me of my sins, wash me clean. For I've decided today to follow Jesus. From this day, I'm yours. In Jesus' name, amen. We hope you enjoyed the message. If today you want to take your next step with God and give your life to Christ, please visit mycalvary.com forward slash begin. We have a free gift for you. We also want to encourage you to share this message with all your friends and family and follow us on Facebook and Instagram. From all of us at Calvary, God bless you.